Well, hello, friend, and welcome to another episode of Van Life Living in New York. I'll tell you, I did get some footage that I'll put at the end of this of me out on that rock behind me, out on the point of this rock pile that goes out over nothingness. But unfortunately, because of these wind gusts that are kicking up out of the middle of nowhere, there's no way I can sit out there on that rock. Because even though it appears flat to you, it's really not. And there's only a spot that I could put the chair. And if the wind blows, and either the camera goes to go or the chair does, I'm gonna lose one or the other in a wind gust because I won't be able to grab for both. There's no room out there for that. And since I do all this traveling on my own in the woods and I don't have a crew that follows me and takes care of these things, <laughs> I have to kind of make sure that my equipment doesn't get damaged or I don't have any money for new stuff because well, God gives me everything I need, but not a penny more most of the time, friend. <laughs> and as you know, I don't ask for money on these videos, never have. Well, I did a long time ago when I was doing The Kingdom Within. And at the very beginning of Van Life Living in the Ark, I did. But nobody really uh, responded to that. I've had three people donate over four years and four people. Yeah, something like three or four people. One was my mother for $40. <laughs> so today I'm out here at this Pinnacle Overlook and I come part way down the hill to this little overlook where not as many people come because it's way down a steep hill and well, it's not gated off as you can see. If I make a wrong move, I fall off a cliff pretty much any which direction, but that's okay because it's a beautiful view and I feel pretty stable sitting where I'm at even though you'll notice that I'm holding my hiking stick because I found a little spot in the rock where I can put it to keep my chair from tilting because, well, my chair is tilted a little bit, but I just, uh, as long as I don't fall over and start rolling, I'll be all right. Because <laughs> it'll hurt if I fall way down there, friend. <laughs> so anyway, I always come on here to talk about Jesus, as you know, and that's what I come on here to talk about today, like I always do. I just love the life that my father's given me even though it's a tough life it's a great life and it's not so tough now but on the other hand friend I don't know if you've ever tried to have faith but I'm walking in faith that I've got no job and like I said nobody donates and God gives me these tiny little contributions here or there somebody needs me to do something or I do something for somebody or somebody just outright gives me 20 bucks because they're a family member you just you never know. It doesn't matter because I really don't need anything. And since I'm taking care of my mother, she sees it that I get gas in her Jeep so that I can get around and uh, do these videos because she knows this is what's important to me in my life. She doesn't understand what I do, nor does she watch anything that I do, really. I don't blame her because, well, she has her own relationship with God, and that's between her and God, right? Now, you know that Jesus said that a prophet is only without honor in his own hometown, right? So you know that if you try to preach to people that you know that it's almost pointless because they won't believe anything because they know who you were, not who you are. And even though you are something new in Christ, sometimes you still make mistakes, and especially with family, because they're the ones you trust the most. And and you're used to dealing with them for the same way for years. So it took me a long time to learn how to become something new in Christ, even around the people that, um, and that doesn't mean I'm perfect friend because I'm not here to talk perfection. Jesus said the kingdom starts as a mustard seed and turns into a mustard tree. A tree that uh, back in Jesus's time, that was a big garden plant and they would the birds could find shade and rest in it. So what he was saying is, even though he came for those in need of a doctor and those like me that were in desperate need of a doctor, even though our kingdom would start off like a little seed, that if we would take care of it and tend to it and study what Jesus said and do the things he asked, that our little seed would grow and grow and turn into a mustard tree. And that's what he's talking about, friend. So that's what I've been doing in my life is trying to grow this seed into a mustard tree. And friend, I wasn't even understanding his parables. I didn't quite get what all this was talking about. I'm like everybody else. But I just wouldn't give up. And 
when I did give up because I was all knocking lightly, remember Jesus said, if you want the bread of life, that it's like when you're going knocking on the door to your neighbor's house in the middle of the night looking for bread. And he said that if you knock lightly, that, you know, when you knock, the neighbor's going to be like, go away, the hour's late. I'm in bed with my children. So you have to be knock out of sheer audacity. So when he doesn't get up, you have to be like, Father, give me my bread, right? You got to really want this kingdom that Jesus was talking about. Because he's going to he's gonna do all the work, but you're going to have to do all the work too, right? Because you're going to have to do the things he asked. You're going to have to give your gifts in secret. Because if you're like me and you were a person that was full of selfishness and had a lot of guilt and shame and anger, well, the way Jesus told you to do these things is how it is that you find this kingdom. So because my thought of Satan is my thought of selfishness, right? So, and it's not only the one that talks me into doing the wrong thing, it then judges me and then holds me accountable for all eternity, always reminding me of what I did wrong. And it's always reminding me of what other people did wrong too, because if I look at the speck in your eye, then the plank remains in my own eye. So the only way for me to remove the plank is to let my Father do it for me through the Holy Spirit. But that means I have to not judge you because <clears throat> here's a clue, friend. If my Father knew the end in the beginning and I judge you for what you're doing, I judge my Father for allowing it because my Father knew the end in the beginning. He knew everything you were going to do wrong and He created you anyway. Now that's not an excuse to do the things wrong because I was doing the things wrong and that's not an excuse. I just didn't know any better. Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. He meant that. <laughs> Friend, I tell you he meant that because now I mean it when I say it because I see the truth of what he was saying, but it's the Father through the Holy Spirit that gave me this truth and unrattled, un, uh, veiled all the truths behind these parables that he spoke. You know, I didn't realize that every day of my life I was building a tower. The question is, was I weighing out the uh, price that it was going to cost? And the answer is no. My whole life is full of half-built towers. It's a cemetery of half-built towers. <laughs> things I was trying to build for the world, things I tried to build for him, but I wasn't understanding everything. So it took me a long time to do this and get willing because Jesus said that he who saves his life will lose it, but he who loses it for his sake will gain it. Well, I couldn't really truly gain my life until I was willing to lose it. Because my thought of selfishness, which is my thought of Satan, also is my thought of fear. And so every time I go to talk on behalf of the Father, my thought of Satan reminds me that because what Jesus said was, that if you come to love him more than the world, the world would hate you for it. And someone might kill you thinking they're doing God a favor. So my father has me talking about all kinds of hard truths on here, not just about parables, but we're at, the, uh, at a late hour toward the end of the age, friend. And I don't care whether you believe it's tomorrow or next year or in next decade. You need to make some new choices here, friend, because this nation is a Christian nation and they are just not thinking about what they're thinking about. You know, anybody that looks could have seen the truth about that Trump, but nobody wanted to look. Everybody says, oh, well, you know, he's going to make America great again. Well, Jesus said he was the least among us. And so to be like Jesus is to be the least for selfishness and the least for the world. And then to be the most for love, which is to be the most for my father. So that's how he was the least. He was the least to the world in selfishness, but he was the most to the, my father and love. And my father is love. So the truth of love and the love of truth is love. <laughs> but as I talk to you on here often about that my father had to create a dichotomy in order to make this work because free will can't be given unless it's received, right? And so therefore he had to create a thought of what is, what is not yet is, which is your thought of selfishness, your thought of Satan. And my father wasn't expecting perfection. Don't get me wrong, because you are divine. You are die to vine fruit. So you are the fruit of two vines. 
but he wants you to be in his image and likeness. Just like the Father and the Son could have chose to be selfish, they choose to be love. And Jesus told you that in all kinds of different ways. Like he told you that the Father is a slave to all, right? And a lot of Christians will get offended by that. But listen to the statement Jesus made. When Jesus was talking to the apostles, his disciples, after the sons of thunder and their mother came to him and asking if they could have the throne to the right and the left, they all, the others got indignant. So he said that those that um, are, it's not going to be like here. You know, here, those that have great power, master over people. He said in the kingdom, it's not so. He said that if you want to be great in the kingdom, you have to be a servant. And to be greatest in the kingdom, you have to be a slave to all. So what he was telling you is that my father is the greatest in his own kingdom. He's a slave to all. Now that doesn't mean that he has to be. It means he chooses to be because that's the way he is loved. He gives to us our will instead of his. It is not his will that we murder each other, that we allow all this neglect and abuse and traumatizing of everyone. This is not my father's will, but my father has to let you do it or else he would be taking away your will. But you're not only doing it to yourself and to others, you're doing it to him. And Jesus said a lot of things in a lot of ways. Like he told you, Jesus said, hang all the laws and all the prophets on only two commandments and one was like the other. Why is it like the other, friend? Well, let me tell you, because my father's in your neighbor and your neighbor's in my father. Jesus told you the fathers of spirit, right? He said that to the woman at the well and much earlier in the Bible in the Old Testament, it says that God has no form and therefore you are not supposed to worship creation. You're supposed to worship him, which is to worship him in spirit and in truth, which is in thought and in love, which is actually worship means adoration for a deity. So he wants you to adore him in thought and love. So anyway, that's what he wants, but he can't make you do that or else he then takes away your free will. And my father will never take away your free will because then it wouldn't be free will, would it? Then it would be partially free. He wants children. So those of us that choose to do what he asked will then become a child. So if you want to be his child, then you have to get to know Jesus inside and out and tear those te parables apart. Because Jesus said, I'm gonna speak in parables so that you don't understand lest you turn and be forgiven. Friend, did it ever occur to you that that means that God didn't want you forgiven? I'll tell you, friend, when, he, when I recognized the things that Jesus was saying, it was upsetting and I didn't understand it at first. So I'm not here to tell you this is something easy to figure out. I'm telling you that it's a challenge. But if you want to know my father, then you get to know the firstborn son because he gave you everything in parables so that you could have the truth. Now, if you don't want the truth, that's okay, but understand that this world is designed so that you can't succeed without the Holy Spirit, the voice of my Father. Once again, Jesus said that the Father says it to him, he says it to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit says it to you. What he's telling you is that he's the intercessor between God and you. So. But there's a reason for that. Everybody thinks it's all about that we're not worthy and only he's worthy to talk to the Father. But what he's really doing is he's keeping the Father blameless because my Father wants to be loved. So he doesn't want to judge his children. That's why it says Christ breaks the seal, right? So my Father doesn't break the seal. Christ does. So that is how he's interceding. He's going to keep my Father blameless. So you all sometimes think of this intercession and you're not really getting what's going on. And that's the reason my father made Abraham a promise. You see, because Jesus went and gave his life because he was my father's firstborn son. It said right that on first page of Revelation. It said the only begotten and the firstborn from the dead. So he was the firstborn son of God. And he was given to the Jews because that was my father's promise to him because Abraham 
put his firstborn son on the altar, the thing that he loved the most. You got to understand that in, in the day, in Abraham's day, his firstborn son would inherit his whole kingdom, right? So, by Jewish law, he was willing to sacrifice the thing that was, you know, his inheritance. It's everything that he was going to pass on, all that. Well, understand that my father sacrificed his firstborn son. Now, understand that Jesus didn't die because you see that, but he was willing to be sacrificed nonetheless, and he was. So, Christians think that that was all about you, and it's not, friend. It was all about Abraham. It was a promise to Abraham because Abraham did what Jesus and my father did, except for when Abraham went to sacrifice his son, then God, through an angel, said, hey, don't do that, right? So all he wants is your willingness. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross, friend. He told you that. He prayed. He said, please, let this cup pass from me. Nonetheless, your will, not mine, be done. Friend, I don't want to talk this truth because I know that I'm not without sin, and so therefore a lot of the things I say sound like judgment. So I can assume that sooner or later somebody's going to want to kill me thinking they're doing God a favor. Jesus told me that, friend. It's, it's right there in the Bible. However, I don't have to want to die. I only have to be willing. And that's up to my Father what He does with me. I'm to trust Him and allow Him to do with me as He will. Now, you can't know that I'm speaking on behalf of my Father, but I am. And it doesn't matter whether you believe that or not, friend, because they didn't believe Jesus, right? <laughs> Only those that actually saw him raised from the dead. And friend, I'm not healing or doing anything special. Nor do I want to, because I'm going to tell you something about me. I'm a prodigal son, which means that I was, I took a trip on the dark side, friend, which means my thought of Satan, which is my thought of selfishness, has all kind of things to hold me accountable for. It's always trying to tempt me with all kinds of things. Because, friend, if you've never been down the dark side, some of that stuff seems fun at the time. People act as though it's traumatic being out there having sex and all that. And the truth is, it is traumatic because you're hurting other people and yourself, but you're not conscious of it at the time. It feels good to the flesh. And so if you're not in tune with your spirit, your flesh begs for more and you are and you won't listen to the spirit within, right? Now, I listen to the spirit within, so I can't let my flesh just have everything at once. Instead, I give my thoughts to my father and he tells me what's mine. Like on the way here, I had a chocolate milkshake and a peanut butter cup. Compliments to my father because he told me I could because I, I don't want to spend the couple dollars I have, friend. Because I try to keep that for what I need. I mean, I don't have a lot of money. I got a very limited amount. But my father tells me what's mine and what's not. You'll say, oh, that's unhealthy. But friend, everything they're giving us to eat is poison. I'm not worried about how long I live. The question is, am I in relationship with my father? And the answer is yes. And that's the only thing that matters to me. Sounds like there's a train going on the other side of the river. You might not hear it, but I can hear it quite well because I've got this mic on so that you don't hear the wind and all that. I did hear a boater down there screaming and yelling as they were going along. Sounded like a lot of kids. <laughs> People out having fun on the river, friend. I used to have boats and I used to like to have fun on the river too. But anyway, so the flesh is always begging for things that aren't good for the spirit. And so we have to, it's not that you're going to be perfect because you are divine right and you have needs but jesus said don't store your treasure up here store it up in the kingdom and you can't really store it up in the kingdom without giving it to your neighbor because you can't give anything to your father right because my father's of spirit he's of thought but since he's in my neighbor and my neighbor's in him then every gift i give to my neighbor on behalf of him then i've given him a gift and i give him the credit so he gets two gifts. He gets the gift that I give to his other child, and then he gets the credit that I give him for it, right? And then with a little luck, one of these people that I help will run into other people doing that, giving them gifts in the name of the Father. And before you know it is, they'll be like, hey, I want to get to know this Father because I love these people that are helping me even though I don't deserve it. 
Because, friend, I didn't deserve it when people helped me. <laughs> I'm just nothing special. When I tell you, if when you see who I am, you'll just see that I am not even worth this message. And I've told you in other videos. I said that to my father. I told him, I said, I said you can't have me doing this. I'm not worth it. When they figure out who I am and what I've been and the things that I've done, they won't believe a word he said. And my father, you know what he said? He said he doesn't care about that because he's not here. He didn't send me to talk to you if you're righteous because you either know Jesus or you don't. I'm here to gather people from the hedges and the highways. That's what I really want to do, friend. That's what my father told me my job is. Because I have been so pathetic in my life. If my father will receive me, there's just nobody he won't. And you can rest assured in that. So if you're a person that didn't know Jesus and you've even not liked anything they said about Jesus because of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, well, understand that because the Christians have their Pharisees just like the Jews had theirs. I call them Pharisees so that you understand that Jesus was not judging a people. He was judging a thought system. And the church has the same thought system that the Jewish temple did. Now, not all of them, but some of them. And so, therefore, it's important that if you want to have a relationship with my father, you stop listening to Pharisees wiggle half a tongue like a serpent and start listening to what Jesus said. Because if Jesus was the life, then he's the truth. And if anything he said was a lie, then so is John 3.16. Pharisees love to tell you that Jesus wasn't talking to you when he was talking about the rich man stepping over Lazarus outside of his gate. Friend, why would my... Why would Jesus waste his wind talking to people that he was going to send to eternal hell? Do you get what they're saying? They're calling Jesus a liar every which way to Sunday, Saturday, every day. So understand that I'm not asking you to listen to me or believe me, but I'm sure not asking you to go to listen to some preacher wiggling half a tongue telling you half a truth. I'm asking you to go get a red letter edition of the Bible and read what Jesus said in red. And if you do that and you believe what he said is true, because he said crazy stuff, friend. He said, when you loan money to people, pray they don't pay you back. What kind of insane statement is that? Well, I know what it is now, right? So now you go figure it out. Jesus said that if you did not doubt, you could say mountain or tree move and be cast into the sea. And if you did not doubt, it would be done. Is it true? Because if it's not, Jesus is a liar, right? So I hope you're getting this. It's a riddle, friend. The question isn't, can I do it? The answer to that is yes. But I can't do it. Only the Father could. But why would the Father do it, right? So I used to spend hours out in the woods trying to figure out how to walk on water and say mountain move and be cast into the sea and have it done. But it was by trying to understand what he said because it was clear to me that if everything he said wasn't true, then he wasn't the truth, and therefore he wasn't the life. Right? So don't listen to the Pharisees telling you lies. Go listen to Jesus tell you the truth. And then figure out the riddles he gave you, because everything he gave you was a riddle and a parable. It had meaning, friend, I promise you. So the fact is that none of us have that power, but neither did Jesus, right? Jesus killed the... Um, tree because it didn't bear fruit, but Jesus didn't do it, did he? No, of course he didn't. Do you know why you know that? Because when he went and raised Lazarus from the dead, he said before he did it, he said, thank you, Father, for hearing me. You always hear me. I only say this out loud so that they may hear me. So what Jesus told you was that because he thanked the Father for it and knew that it would get done, the Father did it for him. So it was not Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. If it was Jesus doing it, he would not have said that prayer out loud and had it put down in writing so that you could see this, right? So don't listen to the Pharisees tell you that he's equal with God, because he's not. In the beginning, there was only God. However, my father created a son, right? And the son has his family, which happens to be us. And if I go into it, you'll never even understand it. Jesus said, how can I 
tell you of the kingdom if you can't even understand these simple things. The things that I know, if you want them, you're going to have to go to the Holy Spirit and get them directly. Because you won't believe them from me. I wouldn't believe them from you, friend. If my father wouldn't have revealed these things to me, I just wouldn't believe the things that I know. But I don't even know them for a fact. I just know them because I believe because the Holy Spirit showed me. So therefore, I have faith that it's true. It's like this eternal hell. That never made sense from the beginning, friend. But that's not the word he used. Hades is hell, and he only used it once at Caesarea Philippi. The other places, he said Gehenna, the Valley of Gehenna. And so, you know, Gehenna's fire. So Gehenna was a place or state of mental suffering, if you go back to the Greek words, right? And the Valley of Gehenna, there in Jerusalem, was a place where from a, a group of people from the tribe of Judah used to worship a god called Malchus, because, and they used to sacrifice their children on Malchus's altar. Just like in America, this Christian nation, we worship our corporate gods and we sacrifice our children on their altars. This selfishness, friend, you know where it's from. Nobody will admit it, but everybody knows. Anybody that looks will know. It's not a coincidence that all of a sudden mass shootings are increasing in our schools and in our streets. It's not a coincidence that our children are confused on whether they're boy or girl. Friend, these corporations are outright intentionally doing that. Go look. They're shoving that stuff into your schools. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, I get that you think you're gay because you're attracted to another person differently. But what makes you think that you're going to be different just because you change your genitals? That doesn't even make sense. So they're advertising you to go get your groin chopped off. And... I'm not judging you for it, friend. If that's what you want to do, more power to you. I know a lot of people that, that have had it done. I have, now they haven't gotten the surgery done, but I have two nephews that are now my nieces. I don't judge them, friend. Jesus said, do not judge. You don't know how to judge. My father knew the end in the beginning, and he knew that my nephews were going to think about becoming my nieces, right? So if my father knew that, in the beginning and he created it anyway and created them well then if I judge them I judge my father for it because if I say that what they're doing is evil then I'm saying my father's evil for allowing it you're not getting what these Pharisees are doing friend Jesus told you not to do that and you, I'm gonna I haven't done it in a little while I'm gonna give you a set of statements that I want you to follow along with if you can Jesus said don't judge. You don't know how to judge. Only the Father knows how to judge. Then he says, My Father won't judge you. He sent me to judge you. Then later he said to the Pharisees, I won't judge you, but if I did judge you, I would judge you rightly because I would judge you by my Father's standards. Then, at the Last Supper, he said to them, I came to save you, I won't judge you, but at the end of the age, another one's going to come and judge you with my words. But the one at the end of the age, since he's not the firstborn and not without sin, he can't judge you either, right? So therefore, no one's judging you, friend. It's you that are going to judge yourself at the end of the age. Those of you that said you knew Jesus, when you all of a sudden it is revealed to you what Jesus was saying and what he meant, you will be judged by yourself. You will cast yourself from the kingdom. My father won't have to do it. Jesus won't have to do it. You will hang your head in shame because you said that you believed in Jesus, yet you never got to know him. And because you didn't get to know Jesus, you didn't get to know my father. That's a fact, friend. I don't care what you say. People can wiggle their half tongue, tongues, their half, half a tongue wiggle, and say what they want. But that truth isn't true unless you know Jesus inside out, upside down, and backwards. Because... Everything I'm telling you is what the Holy Spirit has given me, right? Jesus said that what I whisper in your inner ear, you're to shout from the rooftops. So he whispers it in my inner ear, and I shout it from the rooftops. I don't want to shout it from the rooftops, but I don't think about what I'm going to say. Jesus told me not to. I didn't know, have a clue on what I was going to say when I got out here. I didn't even know where I was going when I left the house. About halfway to this destination, 
all of a sudden I knew I was coming here and then I knew which park I was going to and I had a vision of this rock and then I was going to come down and do a video here because that's the where the Holy Spirit showed me to go. So that's why I'm here at this park on this rock doing this video. Now, I'll be quite honest with you. I was thinking about doing it out on that end rock, but the wind, like I said, was blowing way too hard and I'm not going to lose this chair that I cannot afford to replace because this is the most awesome hiking chair my father got me. And it's a long story on how he did that, but my father's a miracle worker, friend. He'll give you everything even though you need nothing. I was hiking and doing without a chair for the longest time and then he sent me to Pittsburgh. I learned some stuff up there. You know one of the things I learned up there? He, he had me go, not only did I go up there and just see Pittsburgh for the first time ever, I had a nice drive through the mountains. This is going back a couple years now, whatever, three years, I'm not sure. But he also took me, told me to go take a tour of a mine. And you know what I learned, friend? That the miners, because in the day, their job was so dangerous that they were highly unlikely to not even survive the day. So when their wives packed them their lunches, they ate their cake before their sandwiches because they weren't sure if they were going to live to get their cake. So they would eat the cake first and then eat the sandwich later because they wanted the best part of the meal to enjoy in case they didn't survive to the end of the day. Friend, that's seriously living one day at a time. <laughs> that is living one moment at a time, isn't it? And I could go on and on about that because there's a whole lot more I learned about that through the mind thing. I learned that the corporations cared far more about money than they cared about their safety. Imagine that, corporations caring th more about money than people. Oh, did I just say that? <laughs> I've been saying it, friend, over and over, trying to hope you get the point. Because the end of the age is coming, friend. The hour's late, and you really need to be looking at the truth of what that Bible was saying. My father put it all in code. The code is being unraveled. I'm not unraveling it all. He doesn't show it all to me. Even Troy Black will tell you that the father testifies to each of us in part. So he testifies some things through Troy Black, some things through me, some things through other people. So if you want the truth, you have to seek my Father and He'll lead you to the right places, right? That's the whole point. The point is my Father created this so that He could know love by experience. Yet He wants you to know love by experience too. But you're not going to cheat Him out of that. You're not. So that's the reason the end of the age is going to be so traumatic and why Revelation talked about it. It's not that my father's angry. He knew the end in the beginning. But he told you that 2,000 years ago so that it would be clear to you when the smoke clears from Revelation, when all is done, you will know that God exists because there's no way a bunch of old prophets knew the things they knew unless they were speaking to my father. And they've already got all this prophecy stuff laid out. They've already found Sodom from Sodom and Gomorrah. It's in Jordan, and it literally was destroyed by fire. They found that uh, Trinitite, which is where sand turns to glass over 5,000 degrees. I'm telling you, friend, you all think that this Bible isn't true, but I'm telling you, he told you in the final days he would make it clear to you. So if you're not looking, that's the reason you don't know. I've made a list called Clues to the Kingdom. It's got all kinds of things that are upcoming. Some of it's geological about the U.S. It doesn't matter. I don't care if you believe anything I say because it's. I'm only listening to geologists talk about what they know. They're not Christians. They're geologists. Some of the people I have on there are other Christians and other prophets that have said things. Troy Black said some things. Um, Dr. Billy Byrne, I think is her name, she said some things. There's a thing called parables that researched the fact that, you know, you all believe that, that Constantine put crosses on his shields. But, you know, there's a, const, there's a thing in Rome called the Constantine Arch. 
and it tell and Constantine had it built to tell the story of the um, battle, and I forget what the name of the battle was, but the battle where he supposedly was converted. Well, friend, on the arch, he did not have them put crosses on the shields, and there's what appears to be a um, addition of Apollo. Well, if that's Apollo, it, it sure wasn't Christ, I can tell you that. And if you, they also will tell you about the layout on how, where it's set up and the angle and exactly where it's at is where it is because there used to be an Apollo statue that would sit right behind it when the sun set at a certain time. There's a whole lot going on, friend. You ought to go look at some Christian truth, but you better also go look at some atheist truth because these Christians are wiggling half a tongue. The church won't tell you the truth because they want your money and they want your devotion. I don't want your money and I don't want your devotion. I want you to go read what Jesus said and read. And I want you to find the truth of love and the love of truth. It's yours to have if you choose it. But if you don't choose it, you can't have it. And the kingdom is only for those that are seeking it. So if you seek the kingdom, you'll receive the kingdom. But if you don't seek the kingdom, you're not going to know my father. You have to get to know the son to get to know the father. And if you don't know one, you don't know the other. And just because you said you believed in one does not mean that you really do. That is exactly what Jesus was talking about when the brides have to awaken at the end of the age. You're going to see exactly how true that is when his brides wake up and they don't have enough oil and everybody starts scampering to get oil. I'm not telling you lies here, friend. I've explained that multiple times in different videos. I've been telling you the truth about what Jesus said and what he meant. So you can either accept this truth as true or call it a lie. I really don't care. I mean, most Christians didn't even believe Jesus. Why on earth would they believe me? <laughs> so, but don't, don't get caught with them, friend. Don't get caught sleeping. Now's a great time to awaken and start doing the things Jesus asked. And if you're a person that didn't believe in Jesus because you didn't believe in religion, I don't blame you. I didn't either. I only sought him in desperation because I did believe that they had enough proof proving that he willingly died. And that was enough for me to start trying to figure him out. So before I believed he was the son of God, even though they tried to teach me that a long time ago, I didn't buy into that babble. I only bought into it once I understood what he said. I'm telling you that Jesus is the greatest psychiatrist ever born. Because my father knows exactly how your brain works. He was telling you how to override your amygdala and work in your frontal cortex, which is the thinking part of your brain. There's all kind of stuff going on. That's why it said front lips between their eyes in the Old Testament, friend. The frontal cortex is the frontlets between your eyes, right? That's where your, the seal goes, God's seal. And the thinking part of your brain. Those of you that won't think about what you're thinking about keep reacting in the amygdala. And those of you that are out there drinking and getting high and having sex with everybody and not caring that they have to go abort their children and, and all that stuff. Friend, I'm telling you, there's a debt to all of this. And if you don't repent and make a new choice, the debt you owe is the debt you're paying whether you said you know Jesus or not. You know whether you know Jesus. You know that if I've said all these things that Jesus said and you don't know he said it, then you don't know Jesus. You don't have to believe me, though. That's what I keep telling you. Don't believe in me because I'm going to tell you the truth, friend. With this AI and the way that it's going, you won't even be able to tell if it's me saying what I'm saying because, you know, you've got dead actors starring in big movies, friend. Do you get that? Fast and the Furious and Star Wars both have big name actors that look just like the actors. I wouldn't know the difference. So don't you believe in me? You go get a red letter edition of the Bible and read what Jesus said in red and you'll see that everything I said, he said first, period. It's that simple. You don't have to believe in anybody. You've got the firstborn. And when the Holy Spirit came down upon him at baptism and remained, before that, he was Jesus. After that, he was Christ. Jesus Christ, the mouthpiece of my Father. And every word out of his mouth 
had purpose. And those that do not get to know his words did not eat his flesh. And because you did not eat his flesh, you did not drink his blood, which is his spirit. See, the church lied to you about that too. It says right in the beginning of John that Jesus was the word made flesh. Word flesh. So if you do not eat his flesh, meaning his word, and drink his blood, meaning his spirit, you will by no means enter the kingdom. That is what Jesus said. The whole reason he did the blood, the wine and blood and the bread and his body was so that he could complete Yom Kippur between Jesus and Judas. I'm not going to go into it because I'm getting ready to hang it up here, friend. But go look that up. Go listen to my other videos, friend. If you go look at Yom Kippur and you go look at the exchange with Jesus and Judas, you will see that Jesus was not only the Alpha, but he also came to represent the Omega. He was the beginning and the end, friend. He did it all in one shot, and nobody saw it because my father hid it because now the Jews are going to need to know it. So when the wilderness, wilderness goat shows up, the Jews will go, Oh, Christians aren't doing what they were supposed to. It turns out Jesus wasn't telling them to worship on Sunday because what Jew is going to turn and worship on Sunday, friend? You're breaking the ten laws written in stone. And you want them to give up the other 613 laws? Are you out of your mind? Jesus told you, I don't come to remove not one jot or tittle from the law. Not one stroke of the pen. You let them deceive you, friend. They are serpents. My father never said that he was going to send a representation of Christ to become Christ manifest. Since when does the Pope have the right to be whatever they call him? You understand he's Christ's replacement. He's the counterfeit Christ of Revelation. And he received his deadly wound in, in the uh, late 1700s as America was coming up. Go watch America to Babylon, friend. A lot of Revelation is much further gone than what you think. So if you are not going to wake up and you are not going to do what Jesus asked, you are not going to know the Son and therefore you won't know the Father. And the Son is going to say, I don't know you. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked. You didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And you'll say, but Lord, when did I see you hungry, sick, and naked in prison? And he'll say, what well, you did to the least of my brother and mean the least of humanity, you did unto him. He never told you to buy more things and store up your treasure here. He literally told you that most people's seed that he gave you was going to die because you wouldn't figure out Christ. Instead, you'd listen to the Pharisees. So a lot of you that go to church once a week have dead seed. Understand that the Pharisees abided in 613 laws and were giving 10% of their cumin and spice and Jesus called them sons of Satan. Please tell me you don't think that 10% of your income and then being selfish with every th rest of your being was anything of worthy of what it is he was asking for. Even Paul told you faith without works is dead. You're supposed to come to know love by experience. If you're not the spirit of love, then you're still the spirit of selfishness. Those spirits aren't entering my father's kingdom. So you have a choice of either becoming the spirit of love or not. But at the end, he told you that the wedding door was in a close and many people weren't ready. And those that were his brides that thought they were entering the kingdom are going to be shut out. Go ask the Pharisees why it is that his bride's going to get shut out if all you have to do is believe Jesus died on the cross for you. Please go ask the Pharisees some of these lies they're saying. Let them come up with some sort of snake wiggle like they do. Go believe everything Jesus said is true. And I'm telling you, friend, you're going to find a new truth that's far greater than the one you had. And you'll find a kingdom far greater than the one you had. I'm telling you, friend, I love my father. I love the Son. I love you. I'm not judging the Pharisees. I can't judge them. But I have to tell them the truth of what Jesus said. Jesus told you you'd get a message. I'm here to give you a message. I don't care if you believe I'm him or not, friend. It doesn't matter to me. To tell you the truth, I'm hoping 
that you're right and that I'm just crazy because Jesus told you that the messenger was coming at a late hour, friend. So if you're one of those things, if you think for one second that I could be that messenger, I sure hope you're going to go get a red letter edition of the Bible and start reading what Jesus said and read and start really seeking the kingdom and trying to come to know love by experience. Because if you don't have enough faith, love, and relationship with my Father through the Holy Spirit, your house is going to crumble and you're not going to make it to the wedding. Jesus gave you this in parable after parable, friend. I'm telling you so. So I'm hoping you're going to go believe what he said is true and start doing something different so that you can get some different results. Because I keep listening to Christians judge everybody, friend, and he told you not to. And I'm not judging the Christians, but I have to tell them what Jesus said. So therefore, I say this to you. I won't judge you, but if I did judge you, I would judge you with Jesus' words, right? But I'm not without sin, so I can't judge you. Make that clear. There's no judgment going on here. The Word made flesh judged you, and you didn't know it because the Pharisees lied. So now I'm asking you to really go look at what Jesus said and get down and have a relationship with my Father. Because I promise you, if you do the things He asked, you'll end up loving it. But you can't do it out of fear. you got to do it out of love. But unfortunately, at this point, people are going to start doing it out of fear, and fear is unworthy. You've got to do it because you love. But sometimes you'll start. I started doing it before I was doing it for the love of it because I was trying to figure them out. So you might do it for the same reason, trying to figure them out, and then you'll come to love him and your neighbor because you'll discover the people that you thought were so evil aren't evil. They're just lost. And they're lost because everybody in the church keeps giving 10% of their cumin and spice, and then they go out and squander everything, go into Disney World and worrying all about selfish things. And Jesus outright told you not to do that, friend. If you want to know the ones who are going to enter my Father's kingdom, they're working in the soup kitchens, the homeless shelters, they're feeding the hungry, they're clothing the naked, and they're visiting the sick and imprisoned, friend. I hope that you're going to join them. Because if you wait to go to the store to get oil, soon they're going to tell you, when you go to those homeless shelters and soup kitchens, they're going to say, friend, there's no room for you here. They're going to say, go to the store and get your own, which means you're going to have to go figure out your own way of doing it. So now's a good time to start doing it before everybody catches on to what's going down. Because it is going down whether you like it or not. I'm just telling you that. You don't have to believe me. Most people think I'm crazy. I've been talking this message for years. <laughs> not long, but four years. And not straight through. <laughs> it's a long story, friend, but I've had different channels. This is channel number two, plus I had a uh, podcast at one point. But I was talking for my father before I even knew how to do it. My father said, you're going to start speaking for me. And I started doing it. But I, I owed him a debt. I promised him that if he gave me the truth, I'd give him my life. And he showed me a death that I had to agree to. So just like Jesus, I don't want that death, but I have to be willing. Whether he gives it to me or not is up to him. And I imagine he'll probably leave that up to you. So if he needs to put a counterfeit Christ on Satan's altar, there's a good chance I'll end up on it, friend. But it doesn't matter because your thought of Satan can steal my flesh, but only my thought of Satan can steal my spirit. So as long as I don't become selfish and fearful and deny my father, it doesn't matter what you do to me. I win in the end. And, you know, some people will think, oh, well, you could torture. My father knows my heart. It doesn't matter whether they, what they do to me. My father knows my heart. I'm confident of that. I was scared. I told my father, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to do this. There's no way you should use me. I'm going to fail you. And he told me, Jason, you won't fail me. He said, I know your heart. I know exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. You can trust that if you do it for me, I will do it for you. So that is what I trust. I trust that no matter how it goes, it's going to go right, even if it looks wrong. Because I've given my father my everything. He has my love, which is the love of Christ. And he has my thought of Satan, which is my thought of selfishness. And Christ can do with me as he will. Because my father won't do anything because that's not what my father does. 
He's the thought of love. Christ breaks the seal. So therefore, all things that get done in judgment will get done by the Son. The Son's going to judge you so the Father doesn't have to because the Son loves the Father that much. So I just hope you're going to go read Jesus and figure this all out, friend. All right, well, just know that I love you because my Father loves you, and may God bless you and yours.